And so first is, uh, what do we mean by enterprise software-defined storage? So first and foremost, uh, the enterprise class has some connotations historically around absolutely continuous availability, uh, predictable performance, and well understood and architected scalability. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, you have to have very high performance. With all of the new media technologies that are out there, you have to deliver the performance of that media uh, at scale, right? And without compromising that enterprise class uh, capabilities. Another key thing about software defined is that the, the implement, or implication of software defined is you run on commodity infrastructure. And so uh, we've got some interesting capabilities. Not only do we run on commodity infrastructure, uh, but we, we can adapt to new technologies and we can uh, use that technology in smaller increments than have been available historically. Uh, additionally, we have this, this notion of automation. Uh, you'll see in one of our pillars uh, of value uh, what we call data orchestration. And we have some very unique capabilities around how we can dynamically move data within the system in response to changes from the customer, uh, changes within the system, or in various aspects of failure recovery. And then finally, we are working very closely uh, with a number of industry partners, uh, not only to provide the commodity infrastructure that, that everybody would uh, be using already, uh, but also in partnering with them to provide uh, new capabilities in their portfolios. Uh, a little bit about our engineering team. So we were founded in 2013, and we've been shipping product uh, since 2016. Uh, I came out of a, a legacy of uh, enterprise storage from the digital compact HP, uh, but we have a very interesting mix in our engineering teams of people who came out of distributed systems, processor architectures, uh, various things around uh, you know composition of uh, of infrastructure in in cloud scale data centers. The reason that's important is we're we're steeped in what it means to be enterprise storage, but we're not kind of caught up in you have to do it the same way you've always done it. And so what you'll hear today is how we've done things differently to solve the problem of enterprise storage for modern data centers, data centers that are undergoing constant change and growth. So one of the things that's always a challenge in these sort of things is what do we mean when we say something like software defined data center? So first is from the external view, the outside in view is everything is virtualized and delivered as a service. Uh, inside the data center, everything is automated. So provisioning all of the operational aspects are fully automated by software. Next is the assumption that you can't just say we support new applications. We have to support both legacy applications and modern cloud native applications. It can't be one or the other. It has to be one and the other. Uh, and then finally, what is the value of all of that? It's radically reducing the cost of operating your data center and delivering the service to your customer. <coughs> so you'll hear us talk about five pillars. Uh, the first pillar is this notion of data orchestration. I touched on this earlier. I think Eric uh, briefly touched on it. It's this notion of being able to dynamically move data within the system across all of its resources uh, with, without disruption or any uh, impact to the application. Uh, it's a, it sounds like a, something that uh, happens in things like containers and virtual machines, things like this, this notion of migration. But in storage, that's something that historically has not been possible. Uh, delivering performance without compromise. So we have to deliver all of the services you would expect, things like deduplication, and encryption, and compression, uh, replication. We do those things and we have some intellectual property that lets us do those things while still delivering very high performance. Uh, the next thing is this notion of future ready choice, or this notion of being able to adapt to new technology. Uh, we, the way we orchestrate data movement within the system, the way we scale the system, allows us to bring new technology in in small increments, uh, get the benefit of that technology not only for new workloads, but for the existing running workloads. Uh, data center awareness. Yep. Data center awareness is really this notion of we have a place in the data center, but it's not just one rack or a set of adjacent racks. We encourage our customers to operate in a distributed fashion. It may be I'm spreading the data out across many racks because that's the way my applications are implemented, 
or I need to do that for better fault resiliency. I can, I can handle things like rack or row failures. Uh, we want that distribution and we, the system automatically accommodates that and will ensure data is placed to get the benefit of that distribution. And finally, we have this closed loop system, our predictive operations. We're constantly collecting telemetry information from the workloads that are running or new workloads that you want to add and we're optimizing the system so that when those, uh, those applications are running, we can dynamically tune and give you uh, advice on how to change the application or change the policy uh, to uh, better run those applications. And then that's layered on commodity infrastructure available from all the companies our customers currently buy from. Right? So we don't go in and say, you need to use hardware A, B, and C from some vendor you probably don't have a relationship with. We've qualified the hardware from all the companies that the customer would typically be buying from already, so they can just use those existing relationships and layer our software on. Some key use cases. Who, who are our customers? Who do we serve? Uh, the, the typical application for enterprise storage is database acceleration. Uh, so we certainly have that capability, and Bill Bazzari will touch on that. Uh, but oftentimes, customers are implementing more of a service-oriented architecture. So what you'll see across here is mostly things implemented as a service. So database as a service is a very common one for us. Digital-first enterprise. This is companies that are really monetizing data as their business model. And the key reason that we're attractive to them is this ability to adapt to their rapidly changing environment. They don't know from day to day what data they're going to get, how they're going to monetize that, and they need to be able to adapt very quickly to those, those environments and those opportunities. Uh, cloud service providers, the underlying storage infrastructure for a cloud service provider, we have a number of, uh, number of customers who do just that. They use us as their storage backbone. And then enterprises implementing storage as a service within their own environment, we provide that, that underlying storage backbone. We also have some very key partnerships. Uh, I mentioned this notion of uh, working with the commodity infrastructure providers in the industry. Uh, we certainly do that, because that's who our customers are working with to get their infrastructure. But we're also working very closely with a number of providers, and Hewlett Packard Enterprise is, is uh, prominent in that, to fill a gap in their portfolio. Enterprise software-defined storage is really a, a new category. Uh, there's software-defined storage, and many, uh, many startups are doing that. Uh, but in the, on the enterprise side, it, it raises the bar. And we've worked with Hewlett Packard to provide a, a capability in their portfolio that's currently a gap. And we're also working with a number of other providers to do similar things as a way of giving us global reach and a global route to market uh, for our product. So I want to peel, the, peel back one more layer on these five pillars and what we mean when we say things like uh, data automation or data orchestration. Let's get, get the, got a mind of its own. Uh, so when we say data orchestration, what we really mean is this ability to dynamically place data. Uh, most storage systems historically, you define at provisioning time the way data will be laid out forever. Any change to that would be disruptive. You would have basically a loss of, of data access while that change is going on, while that migration is happening. Uh, our system, all the way down into the architecture of the data path, and Nick will get into this, is architected to allow the customer to change their mind. Right? Any customer we go to and say, what is your storage needs for the next three years or five years? The answer is, I don't know. Right? They will make a guess, but if they guess poorly, they're faced with a very costly data migration event. Our system allows customers to move quickly. They can make that guess uh, early in the process, and if they guess wrong, they can change their mind. So that's what we mean by data automation, this ability to move data transparently and non-disruptively to the running applications. Enterprise performance. This is really the ability to deliver the performance of the underlying media, and those medias are changing all the time. Uh, we talk about sub-200 microseconds latency. Our part of that 200 microseconds is roughly 40 microseconds. Uh, so as new media technologies come out or new networking technologies come out, we get to benefit from that and deliver that benefit right to the customer. Rapid technology adoption. Uh, this is one of the reasons I, I joined the company is the ability to adopt new technologies into the running system uh, as soon as they're available, as soon as the customers qualified those, we can bring those in and give the benefit of those new technologies to running workloads. 
uh, very, uh, very key part of the, of the value proposition. Uh, data center awareness. Part of this is this notion of being able to run bare metal virtual machines and containers. And then part of this is the notion of being able to distribute data across the data center or across different data centers, right? Uh, to ensure we're giving you the right performance, co-locating the uh, data very close to the application to give you the right resiliency for, for failure tolerance or even disaster tolerance, uh, and the ability to recover very quickly with something like our deep, uh, level three integration, uh, or layer three integration. And then this predictive operations. This is the notion, and I'll get into this a little more in a second, of being able to use a closed loop system to monitor the way the system is operating, change the way data is laid out to operate better uh, and, and keep on going through this, uh, through, through uh, machine learning uh, that we've implemented in the cloud, work within the system itself uh, to constantly monitor and optimize the system. Can you go back one? Sure. On the, on the data center awareness side, you, you mentioned sort of like, and how are you actually determining data placement? Is that, is your, are you doing something with the host operating system to determine what it considers important data? Because like if you've got a large distributed system like Kafka, right? Yep. And trying to place data becomes a really hard challenge in terms of <coughs> letting so, that system do it versus what you guys are doing. Or, yeah, so we'll get into this a little more in a second. But, but when we define uh, storage, we just define it for an application as opposed to one volume at a time, that sort right. of thing. So we know, uh, we know when the storage is defined, we know what application it's serving, and all the volumes and all the storage associated with that, all of its policies for placement, encryption, replication, snapshot schedules, all those things are defined holistically per application. Uh, and so we place data with that holistic view instead of one volume at a time where we have no idea what that volume is serving. So when you're moving into you know, distributed VM and container environment, that stuff's popping up all over the place. Are right. you following it as it's moving through? So you're, you've got something that's actually keyed into Kubernetes and saying like, hey, we're spinning up new resources over here. We understand that we need to place so, data closer or? So the answer is yes. We can use uh, the, some of the layer three integration. We can know where those requests are coming from okay. and, and move that data closer. If, if, you know, obviously, if we don't have a system closer sure. to the application, right. uh, but when we have that opportunity, we can, we can move the data to that application, closer to that application from both a networking perspective. Maybe you want some separation for fault domains, right? So all of that is kind of built into this, uh, this notion of data placement. Okay, excuse me. Yep. How, uh, how do you define an application? Is it SQL Server? Because if it's SQL Server or Oracle, you can do multiple things with those applications. OLTP is different than a data warehouse. Right, so uh, we, we provide what we call application templates, right, which lets uh, we have kind of some default templates, but it also lets the customer say, here's, here's how I define an application. We have uh, a, a tool that lets you interact with the API and, and it will automatically generate the code associated with creating those and consuming those templates. Uh, and so Nick, I think, well, uh, Nick, are you gonna talk about the API? Uh, yeah, and this relationship to templates and application yep. instances, absolutely. absolutely. Yep, so this, this is good. We're wetting the appetite for the what. I, I'm talking about the what, and we're gonna get into the how here in just Actually, a bit. I have a question too. I mean, uh, just to clarify, are we talking about block storage or file storage? So it's block and object. Block so and you, object. Yeah, so you can do uh, both block storage at a volume level or object uh, with the S3. Okay. 